All right, welcome back. So in our last video, I want to talk about angle curves. Now, an angle curve is a lot like a demand curve, except that whereas demand curves tell you how, do, how much of a good am I going to purchase at any given price, holding everything else constant, angle curves are going to tell me how much of a good am I going to purchase given any possible level of income, holding everything else constant. So these were first developed by a German economist named Ernst Engel, who noticed that poor households tended to spend a larger share of their total income on food than did rich households. And from this, he anticipated that as society became wealthier, as the economy grew, the agricultural industry, right, the share of the economy devoted to producing food would shrink, right, because people's consumption of food wouldn't grow as quickly as their overall consumption or overall incomes. Now, these are useful for a variety of purposes. One thing about them that can be useful is they can help us create tax systems that are more progressive. So knowing that poor families spend a larger share of their income on food than do richer families can let us anticipate that, for example, a sales tax that exempts groceries from taxation is going to be less harmful to poor families than would a sales tax that includes groceries. It can also help us make sense of longer term economic trends. So kind of the opposite of the food example, if you look at the share of income spent on education and healthcare, education and healthcare spending tends to increase as a share of income as households get richer. So over the last several decades, there's been a lot of discussion of the rising, the rising cost of healthcare and education as a share of GDP, where a larger and larger fraction of income goes towards healthcare and education. Angle curves might tell us that this is a result of rising demand as opposed to changes in the, in the internal workings of those industries that comes about from an increase in economic growth, right, in, increasing overall incomes, but also increased concentration of incomes in the hands of relatively affluent individuals, right, who are gonna spend a larger share of their income on those goods. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do when we're deriving angle curves. What it's gonna look like is we're gonna try to figure out, right, what's your optimal choice given some fixed set of options, you know, fixed prices, fixed preferences, as we change your income. So to illustrate this, let's say that you have some amount of income and you're either gonna spend it on avocado toast or on microwaveable ramen. We can imagine that you know, avocado toast is pretty expensive, but it's delicious, right? You love it. Um, every, you know, your heart sings every time you take a bite. Whereas the microwaveable ramen, it keeps you alive, but you're really not a huge fan. Let's imagine that the price of ramen is 50 cents, right? 50 cents a packet and the price of toast is something like $5 per slice, right? Per, yeah, avocado slice. So, okay, so we could imagine drawing your budget constraint, right, at a variety of different incomes. So for example, let's put ramen here, toast here. Let's say you had an income of um, 25 bucks, right? You could afford, oh, I'm sorry, let's put toast here and ramen here. So you have an income of 25 bucks, you could spend it all on avocado toast and get five pieces of toast, or you could spend it all on microwave ramen and get 50 packets of ramen, right? And we could observe your optimal choice, and let's just say that in this case, you really prioritize staying alive. So um, let's say that you end up buying um, 40 packets of ramen and a single delightful slice of avocado toast. Right? Then we could say, okay, well, what would you do if you had a higher income? Right? Like, let's say that your income was 50 bucks. Right? In that case, you could afford up to 100 pieces of ramen, packets of ramen. You could afford up to 10 slices of avocado toast. Let's say that in that case, you would buy more of both. Maybe you would get 60 pieces of ramen or packets of ramen. Sorry, and then you would have enough money left over to buy five slices of avocado toast, right, if I'm doing the math correct. Sorry, four slices of avocado toast, right? And let's say that you had an income, let's do one more. Let's say that you had an income of 100 bucks, right? So you could afford 20 slice, slices of toast, or um, 200 packets of ramen. And let's say then, right, you're really a high roller now. You're not gonna waste your calories 
on boring old avocado toast. So let's say that you drop your consumption of toast down, I'm sorry, boring old ramen. So you might drop your consumption of ramen down to something like 30 pieces of ramen and then increase your consumption of avocado toast to something like 15 pieces, right? So we're just playing make-believe here. We can imagine a set of preferences that would lead to these optimal choices under different incomes. So the way we would turn this, which we'll call an income expansion path, into an angle curve is by taking the information from each of these budget constraints and plotting them on a graph. So if we wanted to make a graph, the amount of ramen that you purchase as a function of income, right? We would say, okay, well, we saw you with an income of 25. I'm sorry, we saw you with an income of 50 bucks. No, I was right the first time. An income of 25 bucks with an income of 50 bucks and with an income of 100 bucks, right? We saw that when you had 25 bucks, you bought 40 pieces of ramen, 40 um, packets of ramen. Right? When you had 50 bucks, you bought 60 packets of ramen. When you had 100 bucks, you went down to 30 packets of ramen. Right? And we know, of course, that when you had no money at all, right, if your income was zero, you would buy no ramen because you'd have nothing and you would be starving. So if we drew a curve through those points, it might look something like this. Right? And of course, we could solve optimization problems in the, in the gaps here to make this more accurate. We call this our angle curve. Now, something I want you to notice here is that this curve is upward sloping for a while, but then it becomes downward sloping. And the reason is, by the way that we drew these optimal choices, we're effectively assuming that for you, microwavable ramen is an inferior good. What I mean by an inferior good is a good that you might think of as a cheap alternative to something that you like better, as a consequence of which, there's some level of income at which as you get richer, you're going to spend, you're going to actually buy less of the cheap alternative as you shift towards the more expensive and higher quality options. Right? Now, no good is always inferior. This is an important point because if you don't have any money at all, you're not buying anything. So any good that you ever buy, you have to increase your consumption as you increase income at some level of income. If there's any level of income at which you decrease your consumption, then the good becomes inferior. So it could be that all of us, if we realized how great it is to be a high roller, every single thing that we currently own is effectively an inferior good at some level of income, right? We tend to assume that this is a fairly unusual case and that most goods we're going to increase our consumption of as we increase our incomes. We could also, right, take the information from what we're calling our income expansion path and use it to plot an angle curve for toast, right, for avocado toast. Right, our angle curve for avocado toast. And if we did this, right, we'd see that when we had um, just 25 bucks, right, we bought a single slice of toast. When our income went up to 50 bucks, right, we increased our toast consumption to four. And when our income went up to 100 bucks, we increased our toast consumption to 15. Right? So if we plotted this angle curve, it might look like this. Now what you'll notice about this one is, first of all, right, it's always upward sloping because avocado toast is a normal good. We buy more of it as we get richer. You might also notice that the slope is getting less and less steep as I increase my income. And the reason for that is that I'm spending a larger share of my income on avocado toast as I get richer. In other words, increasing my income by say 10% increases my avocado, avocado toast consumption by more than 10%. How do we know that the share of our income that's going to avocado toast is increasing because of the fact that the, show, the slope is getting shallower? Well, you can think about our slope as basically being our income divided by our avocado toast consumption, right? And the share of our income fraction of income spent on toast would be the price of toast times the amount of toast divided by our income, right? So we can think of the slope of our angle curve as essentially the inverse 
of the fraction of our income we're spending on toast because of the fact that this price of toast is constant at all income levels. So we pull something like avocado toast, where we're increasing the share of our income that goes towards the purchase of that good as we increase our income. We call this a luxury good. And it's a special type of normal good. Now, there's another type of normal good, of course, which is a, a good where we increase the amount that we buy as we increase our income, but not as quickly as our income. We're going to call this a necessity good, and it's going to have an increasing slope of our angle curve. Okay, so one last thing that I want to do before I'll let you go back to your, no doubt, very interesting lives, is show you how to calculate an angle curve using our optimization tools. And we're going to do this basically the same way that we calculated our demand curve. And to keep things simple, there's a way we can show the avocado toast um, ramen example, but the math gets pretty tricky. So let's go back to our food and housing example. So let's say that our preferences, right, for housing and food are going to be log of housing plus two log of food, oh, sorry, ln of food, right? And let's say that our budget constraint is going to be, let's say that the price of housing is $3 a square foot, price of a pupusa is still two bucks, and our income we're just going to leave as a variable i. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to solve our optimization problem for our arbitrary income, and in so doing, we're going to get our consumption of housing as a function of our income. So we can write down our budget constraint as 3h plus 2f is less than or equal to some arbitrary i. Right, then we can solve this the way we're used to. We'll say our MRS h and f is going to equal du dh over du df, right? du dh is 1 over h, and du df is 2 over f. So this thing is just going to be 2 times f over h, right? Set that equal to our price ratio. pH over pf, right? It's got to match the UDH over UDF, pH over pf. So then we'll say 2f over h has to equal pH is 3, pf is 2, right? And that's going to let us say that f is going to have to equal, right, 3 quarters times h, right? Divide both sides by 2, multiply both sides by h. What do we do with this? We plug it into our budget constraint. Right? Right, so we'll say 3h plus 2f has to equal i. Right? We plug in 3 fourths h for f and say 3h plus 2 times 3 fourths h equals i. Right? So that's going to be 3h plus 3 halves h. So that's going to be 9 halves h equals i. h is going to equal 2 ninths times, sorry, h as a function of i is going to equal 2 ninths times i. Right? So this is our angle curve. Right? This tells us if you give me an income, I'll give you an amount of housing that you'll consume. Right? If you had $1,200 a month, we would consume two ninths of $1,200. Um, okay. Let's say if we had $900 a month, right, then we would have a 200 square foot apartment. If we had $1,800 a month, right, we'd have a 400 square foot apartment. All right, awesome. Great work today. I'm looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts and all of your questions about this lecture, and I really deeply appreciate you sticking with me. Have a wonderful day.